In this next meditation, which I call the big space of awareness, we'll explore ways of holding things that make us unhappy in the largest and wisest possible space of awareness. I suggest you do this with something that is currently bothering you, upsetting you, or something that keeps coming up as a theme for you, even if you are not feeling it right now. Be kind to yourself in your choice of subject and stop doing this exercise if you start feeling significantly uncomfortable. And I will refer to the thing that's bothering you or that's weighing on your mind as the upset. All right, here we go. Find a comfortable position, one that helps you feel both relaxed and alert. You can have your eyes open or closed, and if you start feeling uncomfortable, opening your eyes can sometimes help. Taking a moment to notice sounds, like shooting stars, appearing and disappearing in a spacious field of awareness. being aware of your body, relaxed and comfortable. Body sensations appearing and disappearing in a spacious field of awareness, like foam on the waves of the sea. Becoming aware of awareness itself, an open, empty space that holds whatever arises, passes through, and disappears. Now imagine the upset appearing in this vast, open, boundless space of awareness like a cloud in the sky. Have the thoughts and feelings, memories, desires, whatever that make up the upset to appear as well in the vast, peaceful space of awareness. To be known to be held in awareness, nothing resisted or pursued, but actually tiny in the open, empty, boundless space of awareness. being aware of how everything flowing through the open space of mind eventually changes.
noticing how things arise and pass away, one thing leading to another and then changing again. Sensing the insubstantiality of whatever appears in the mind. Like swirls of water in a stream, carrying sticks along and then dispersing. feeling a growing sense of peacefulness toward whatever arises, including upsets. A growing peaceful knowing that whatever arises could be pleasant or unpleasant or neutral, but it will always change and move on. taking refuge more and more in a growing knowledge that because everything changes and disperses, you can relax and not cling to whatever appears in the mind. You can let it be what it is without moving toward it or away from it. Resting all the while in the space of awareness and in an underlying feeling of well-being. Coming back to this feeling of peaceful awareness as a refuge if you get distracted. Is anything that passes away yourself? Not really. Softly label whatever arises. Not me. Not self. Not fit to be regarded as I or mine. Be aware of thoughts of self, of I or mine, also moving through the field of awareness. Thoughts of I, actually, are just like any other thought. The sense of self is just one more thought, just one more passing cloud in the vast, open, empty space of mind. Be aware of what happens when there's simply awareness of the different components of an upset with no need to take those personally.
relaxing the sense of self in the upset. Just mental phenomena, like all others, arising and then passing away in the open, boundless space of awareness. While there is a resting simply in awareness itself. This next meditation is called Being for Yourself. And as we discussed in the very first session, as much as we all like to be happy, sometimes there is actually a resistance inside, which you might have encountered in some of the other meditations that we've done here. To help yourself feel as happy as possible and as grounded in a deep and unshakable and reliable well-being, the first step is to have your own happiness matter. But for some of us, that's easier said than done. This meditation has four parts, two of which will involve a little writing, so you want to get a pad and some paper ready before we dive in. What we'll be doing is beginning to release the neurological circuitry inhibiting the expression into the world of your true self and about beginning to strengthen your will for feeding the taproots of your precious life. Okay, here we go. Number one, we're going to be doing some reflections. And so you might like to pause this program from time to time so you have more time to write. Here we go. How have you been for yourself in your life? In what ways have you helped yourself have a good life? How have you stood up for yourself? And how have you acted like your inner experience of loving matters? And now let's look at the other side of the coin. How have you not been for yourself? In what ways have you not helped yourself to have a good life? How have you sold yourself short, not had faith in yourself, lost your nerve?
How have you gotten numb to or discounted your actual experience of living? How have you been excessively critical or mean to yourself? And now you can put your paper and pen down and we're going to do a guided meditation that I call the view from the porch. So first, get a comfortable place to sit and relax. Eyes open or closed, but you might particularly want to have your eyes closed for this meditation. And take a moment to call to mind a basic sense of well-being, of being relaxed in your body, maybe even a quiet, deep-down happiness. Now imagine that you're sitting comfortably somewhere many, many years from now, Let's say in your 90s, with your mind intact, but you're very, very old. And make it concrete for yourself. Imagine that you're sitting in a comfortable location many, many years from now in your 90s, maybe on a porch in a comfortable chair. Get a sense of other people around who care about you. With a sense of vistas before you, like a view down a long valley below. Imagine feeling quite good there on the porch happy and contented, pleased with your life. And from that place, there on the porch, reflect back on your life as a very old version of yourself. Looking back from your 90s, what will you be happy about regarding your life? What will you feel grateful for? What will you feel has been important in your life, looking back in your 90s? What will you feel have been the important lessons in your life? What will you be glad from the porch that you'd stood up for?
In what ways will you be glad that you had acted like your own life mattered, that your happiness mattered? And last, from the porch in your 90s, what will be some of the good wishes that you'll have for the important people that you've known in your life? Let go of the view from the porch and come back into a sense of the present time. And consider your own answer to each one of these five questions. Is it given to me to avoid illness? Is it given to me to avoid aging? Is it given to me to avoid death? Is it given to me to avoid being separated one way or another, one day from everything I enjoy and love? Is it given to me to avoid inheriting the results, positive and negative, of my actions? And now for the fourth and final step in this meditation, you can open your eyes, if they're not already open, and get your paper and pen or pencil. And you might want to title the page, Resolutions From Now On. And as always, you can stop this program if you want to take more time with any part of this. So I'll focus on just one potential area of your life, but I really recommend that you do this exercise on your own with other areas of resolutions from now on. So when you take into account the three things we've done so far, how you've been for yourself in your life and how you haven't, the view from the porch, and the five reflections. What do you see that you want to do from now on? The three most hopeful words in the English language, from now on, to make your life better. To tend more to the causes of happiness and well-being. There are many areas of life that you can 
reflect on. Health, relationships, career, spiritual life, family, creativity, and so forth. So first, pick one. And then consider these questions. In this area, from now on, how could you stick up for yourself more? In this area, from now on, how could you better fulfill the longings in your heart? In this area, from now on, how could you be more disciplined? From now on, for this area to go better in your life, what do you need to let go of? For this area in your life, from now on, what could you do to get more of the support you need? And last, from now on, related to this area of your life, how could you be more virtuous as you decide that for yourself? For example, in this area, from now on, how could you do no harm to yourself or to others? Or how could you be completely honest or on the one side, more restrained when you need to be, or on the other, stronger and more assertive. From now on, more truly supportive of the things that will make your life better and make you feel happier in the major areas of your life.
this meditation, working through an upset, is actually more like a combination mini micro lecture and exercise. The thing is, unless we're completely enlightened, you go through life, things are upsetting, they're aggravating. You got somebody on the phone who's put you on hold for 20 minutes. Somebody in your family does something that really bothers you. There's a disappointing or frustrating experience at work. You're stuck in traffic and you're late for a meeting, etc., etc. Life is upsetting. It's great to know that you've got some go-tos, some things you can do that actually work. So from 35 years of experience working with people, here are nine different ways to deal with something upsetting that's disrupting your happiness and well-being. I'll be listing these nine, some of which have already been trained in the different meditations or exercises in this program, and we'll be going through each one. As always, of course, you can stop the program if you want to take extra time with any one of them. So for starters, imagine something that's bugging you, either currently or tends to come up, and we'll call this, as I've called it before, the upset. Here we go. So, number one, have compassion for yourself. We've worked with that already in this program in terms of self-compassion. And at the moment that something happens that's upsetting, or you recall something that's upsetting, the first thing you want to do is mobilize a kind of warm-heartedness for yourself. A kind of, ooh, ouch, ew, that hurts, yuck. It's not self-pity. You're not wallowing in self-pity or anything like that at all. You're simply bringing an ordinary human quality of compassion to yourself like you'd bring to anybody you cared about. If your friend called you up and said, can you believe what just happened? This is what happened, da 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 Your first movement of your heart, probably, would be a kind of compassion for your friend. Ooh, ooh, darn, sorry. Sorry you feel that way. Sorry that happened. Second, see the big picture. Try to think about the many, many things that have led to the situation occurring in terms of what the other people have done, the setup, and all the rest of that, as well as the many, many things that led to your own reactions. For example, the truth is, most of the time, we really are bit players in other people's dramas. They do what they do. They're harsh with us, they interrupt us, they cut us off, they forget about us, they don't call us back. Whatever it is they do, very often it's because of 10,000 things floating around in their life, some of them reaching back in time to when they were a kid, some of them going back generationally to where their great-grandparents grew up, that have rippled forward today to affect how they are when they're bumping into you. It doesn't mean that it's not unpleasant, but it does mean that you can see the big picture. There's actually a kind of famous parable called the parable of the log that really is an illustration of this point. Here it is. Imagine that you're out in a canoe on a nice, slow-moving river with a dear friend, and let's say it's Sunday, and you decided to get all dressed up and have a special picnic. So there you are in the canoe, dressed in your nice clothes. You've got your picnic lunch you're having with each other, your nice cutlery and plates and all the rest of that. And suddenly, whoop, there's a big bang on the side of your canoe, and it tips you over and dumps you and your friend into the cold waters of the river. Ugh! You come up sputtering. All your nice stuff is now at the bottom of the river. Your clothes are ruined, your hair's ruined, whatever. And you look up, and what do you see? You see two teenagers with snorkels and masks have snuck down to your canoe and tipped it over and dumped you in the water. How do you feel? Okay, take two. Same situation. Canoe in the river, friend, Sunday, picnic, everything's wonderful, you're having a great time, nice clothes, fancy dishes, everything's great. Suddenly, whoom, thump, your canoe gets tipped over, you get dumped into the river, all the stuff goes to the bottom, yuck, you come up sputtering, you're wet, you're startled, clothes are ruined, hair's ruined, whatever, and what do you see? Let's say that this time what you see is a big submerged log. It's drifted downstream, and it's bumped into your canoe and tipped you and your friend into the water. Now, how do you feel? Notice the difference. In other words, very often in life, 
Other people are actually just big logs. They're not targeting you personally. You just happen to be in their way. Sure, it's an unpleasant experience to get dumped in the river. It's unpleasant to have whatever has happened that's upset or bothered you. But most of the time, it doesn't necessarily mean that you've been targeted. There were 10,000 things that led to this result today. 10,000 logs upstream, even, of the log that finally got your canoe. Okay, third method, have compassion for the other people involved. You may not like them. You may not approve of what they've done. But still, if you have compassion for them, that's actually going to make you feel better. Paradoxically, instead of somehow giving them a kind of free pass for being a jerk, let's say, by having compassion for them, you actually make yourself feel better and put yourself up on the high moral ground. Those other people involved in upsetting you were once young children too. Sometimes it's helpful to imagine the person who's really bothered you, even, frankly, a political figure, as a little girl or boy. Or imagine the being way back there behind the other person's eyes. They're bugging the heck out of you, and you may need to do some things to protect yourself, which we'll get to later. But meanwhile, you can also have some compassion for who that person is and how they're actually suffering deep down beneath it all. There's actually a kind of a famous story of the Buddha. It, you could take this as true or probably as a kind of parable or fairy tale. But the story goes that way back before the Buddha was really the Buddha, he lived at a time when animals could talk. And so way back when, in one of his earlier incarnations, he was a gorilla. And at this time, a hunter got lost in the forest that the Buddha gorilla happened to be living in. And this hunter fell down a deep, deep hole. The hunter called and called for days and days, but no one heard him until finally the gorilla did. So the gorilla came over to the hole and looked down and saw the hunter at the bottom and the hunter said, get me out of here. Get me out of this hole. So the gorilla climbed down into the hole, very steep and dangerous hole, and said to the man, man, I will get you out of here, but first I have to practice with increasingly heavy boulders to make sure that I can get you out safely. So the gorilla carefully climbed back out of the hole and then began rolling increasingly heavy boulders down into the hole and then lifting them back out again until he was sure he could carry the man safely up and out of the hole. So after doing this for a few times, the gorilla climbed down into the hole, held the man carefully in his arm, and then very strenuously pulled them both up finally out of the hole and landed safely on the ground outside. The man then looked at the gorilla and said, Well, now that you've got me out of the hole, can you guide me out of the forest? And the gorilla said to the man, Yes, man, I can, but first I need to rest. It was so strenuous rolling those boulders down into the hole and carrying them out again and then getting you out of the hole. I just need to rest here for maybe an hour or so, and then I'll guide you out of this forest. So the gorilla then went to sleep. The man sat there, started thinking about his life outside the forest again, and confidence began to grow that he would get out of his pickle. And he started looking at the gorilla and noticing how incredibly hungry he was. The man had been down in that hole for quite some time, and he was starving. He began thinking to himself, this is just a gorilla. It's just an animal. I could pick up one of these big rocks that he's rolled down into the hole to practice on and drop it on his head, kill him, and eat him. And then I'll have a lot of strength and be able to get myself out of this forest on my own. So the man lifted up one of the big boulders, held it up high over his head, and then slam, smashed it down onto the head of the sleeping Buddha gorilla. 
Well, you can imagine. There you are, exhausted and sound asleep, and suddenly a big rock gets smashed in your head. Fortunately, it didn't kill the Buddha gorilla. He sat up quickly, stunned, with blood streaming down his face, dazed, soon realized what had happened, looked at the man, and then, with tears of great compassion streaming down from his eyes, said to the man, shaking his head, Poor, poor man, now you'll never be happy. That story gives me the shivers because it carries two great points. One, it conveys the possibility that we, each of us, can have that kind of compassion for the people in our life who have wronged us or made things difficult for us or mistreated us in any way. And a compassion that comes from the best parts of ourselves. Second, the story teaches us that at the end of the day, we don't need to do justice ourselves. That other people who mistreat us or harm us in any way actually harm themselves as well. It may take a while, but what goes around really does come around. In other words, at the end of the day, deep down in their experience, and often in the actual events of their life, what people do to us and the state of mind that enables them to do it to us comes back to haunt them. And we don't have to get vengeance ourselves. So now, on to the fourth method, scaling events accurately. So often in life, on the zero to 10 scale of badness, things are actually only a one or a two. But somehow we think of them as a six or seven. And actually, once in a while, the truth is, it's really a seven or eight. But we kind of dismiss it. And we don't pick up on the fact that, whoa, something really important and meaningful just happened. So one thing you really want to do when you're trying to figure out your reactions to something is ask yourself, how significant is this really? Am I going to be worried about this in a week or a month or a year, really? If not, why should I even worry about it today? How many people is this going to affect? Is this permanent? Is this irrevocable? Is this solvable? How big a deal is it? And try to scale it in your own mind. This is actually a really good method with other people as well, sometimes with kids, where you basically ask them, okay, on the zero to 10 scale, of awfulness with no 11s or 12s, 10s a max, you know, with World War III being a 10, how bad is this really? And then they'll usually say something like, well, it's a 1 or a 2. Then you ask them, okay, on the 0 to 10 scale of being upset, how bad is this really? And they say, well, it's a 7 or 8. You go, well, hmm, it's kind of a disconnect, really, between how bad the thing actually is and how upset we've gotten. All right. Next item and again, you might be applying these methods to whatever it is that you've thought of that's upset you in the past or perhaps is upsetting you currently. Think about whatever are the preamps. In other words, events occur, situations occur, stimuli, and they hit a kind of preamp inside our mind, which then intensifies them and often distorts them. So for example, recent events can prime us negatively to overreact to situations. Or we could have our own physiology. Maybe we're hungry or tired or sick or in pain. Chronic pain, by the way, really tends to sensitize people to react more intensely to fairly small matters. A third potential preamp is temperament. Sometimes we tend toward anxiety or melancholy or anger. And that temperamental predisposition can, again, shape our response to what's happened. That's why three different people will have three different reactions to the same event. And then the final preempt to think about is your own childhood. Everybody has a childhood. We have the longest childhood of any animal on the planet because we have so much to learn. We learn a lot in childhood, and frankly, most of it is social and emotional, not 
read and write and in arithmetic. And it's natural, it's vital actually, that we carry that learning with us. Sometimes people say, eh, it's just your childhood, why can't you get over it? As if somehow we could unlearn the learning that sank in when we were most primed to learn of any period in our life. So we've all had a childhood, and in its own way, it is the filter through which we experience current events. But by understanding these preamps, childhood, temperament, physiology, recent events, we can put in a kind of correction factor. For example, I know for myself that if I've had a long day and I'm kind of irritable and I pull up at my house, I'll tell myself, Rick, you're irritable, be cool. And I'll walk in with a little more mindfulness about, okay, be careful, because I know I'm a little edgy and thin-skinned. Okay, on to the next method, number six, letting go. We did a whole meditation in this program on letting go, so I won't say much about it right now. You want to think about kind of ABC, that's an acronym, affective, bodily, and cognitive, fancy words. Affective means emotion, bodily is body, and then cognitive is thoughts. You want to think about how can I let go my emotions, my body sensations, and my beliefs that wrap around all of those. How can I let go of them and not cling? And then seven, in the space that's left, when you release, you want to receive. You want to bring things in that are positive, like positive emotions, positive body sensations, and positive thoughts. For example, in this program, we've talked about the sense of the inner protector. That's something very positive to bring in if you've let go of painful feelings of, let's say, being let down or mistreated. We've also talked a lot about peaceful feelings or happy feelings, which can also be brought in to the field of awareness when you've let go. It's interesting, after you've let go, you're really in a good zone for new good things to really sink in, because there's kind of a special space there in the mind, and therefore in the brain. One particularly powerful time to bring in positive influences is just before going to bed because that's when you kind of set yourself up almost semi-hypnotically to have things sink in all night long. So literally just taking a minute or five minutes to call up positive body sensations, emotions, and thoughts just before going to bed can be really helpful. One structured way to do that is to say loving-kindness phrases for yourself just before going to bed, like, may I be happy, safe, and free from suffering. May I be healthy and live at ease. Next, number eight, holding things in the big space of awareness. We did that as a meditation, and you can see the power of that. In other words, we're all going to be upset some of the time. It's a little bit like the difference, though, between dropping a bowling ball on a puddle and then dropping a bowling ball in a lake or even the ocean. Drop that bowling ball into a puddle makes a big difference, but toss that bowling ball into the lake, a splash, and it's gone. You want the open space of awareness to be like a lake, even better, like the ocean, rather than like a puddle. And you want the upsetting experiences you're having to be like a bowling ball dropped into the deep blue sea. In particular, in this big space of awareness, it's so powerful to be very thoughtful about selfing. In other words, thinking of self not as a thing, but rather as a verb, as an activity that arises and decreases in the mind based on conditions. In other words, not as a fixed entity. So if you regard upsetting experiences more as transient events like bad weather or logs <laughs> that dump you into the river rather than regarding them as me or mine or emphasizing the self-referential parts of them, the ways in which, in other words, they come back to you, but simply regard them more impersonally as thoughts and feelings flowing through your mind, as events flowing through your life, 
in a more spacious kind of way. Kind of like, to use a metaphor I used earlier, like twigs caught up in a little swirl in a river that will ultimately disperse, then you'll be a lot happier and have a lot more well-being. And then last, number nine, make a plan. Take action. Take action on your own behalf. Now sometimes the action you're going to wisely take is to do nothing, but simply be with what is and be aware of it and learn your lessons for the future. Other times, though, there really are things to do. It's interesting in life. For example, if you want to get an apple, you can't make the tree give you fruit. But what you can do is you can tend to the causes of fruit. In other words, you can go get a little sapling, find a good place to plant it, dig a nice hole, fertilize the ground, plant it carefully, water it regularly, pick the bugs off over the years, and then finally, voila, it's probably going to give you some great apples. You can't control the results, but you can tend to the causes. So if something's been upsetting, something's been bothering you, you want to make a list, essentially, of all the things you can do all the causes you can tend to, to make the situation better, to make your life better, to make the lives of other people better. And then when you're done with the causes that you can tend to, that's all you can do. Don't worry about the results. But there's a great deal of integrity in not being passive, but in fact taking action on your own behalf and making a plan. Now, I laid these nine things out in a kind of step-by-step fashion. Sometimes you're going to work through all nine in order. Very often, though, you'll just do a few, or you'll do them out of order or whatever. But it's really great to know that these are very reliable ways to tend to the causes of your own well-being. This last meditation will close out this program, and it's called Coming Home to Happiness. It's interesting, with all the different methods, tools, and skills, and perspectives, and so forth we've covered, sometimes it can make a person think that they have to almost manufacture happiness. They have to sort of tweak the instrument panel of their mind in all these very careful and nuanced ways to make it really, really work properly, kind of like uh, tuning a cantankerous Ferrari or something like that. It's really easy to go out of alignment. And it's actually not really true. For one, the natural resting state of the brain, your brain, is calm, contented well-being. In other words, consider when you feel rested and not threatened, not in pain, what kind of a person are you? you're probably really pretty decent. Consider most people when they're not in pain, they're not threatened, they're not frustrated, they're not angry, they're not disappointed. What are they like? They're usually pretty nice, really. And it's interesting that the fundamental resting state of the body-mind is directed by the parasympathetic wing of the nervous system. This is the rest and digest wing. And it's part of the part of the nervous system that, called the autonomic nervous system, that regulates the organism's response to changing conditions. It's kind of like the fundamental thermostat setting of your body-mind. And the complement to the parasympathetic nervous system is the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight, stress response system. It's interesting that if you surgically disconnect the sympathetic nervous system, which sometimes you have to do in extreme conditions, the person can still be alive. In other words, 
they won't be very good in a near accident on the freeway or in the middle of some kind of argument with a neighbor, but they'll be able to function and live and continue to exist. But on the other hand, if you surgically sever the circuitry of the parasympathetic nervous system, within minutes the person will die. Because this part of your nervous system, calm, soothing, resting, digesting, is fundamental to what keeps you alive. It's actually more fundamental than fighting or fleeing, calm contentment. So in that sense, right there, in your own body-mind, your natural condition is calm and contented. Second, deeper than that, in your own experience of doing the meditations, you probably got a sense, if not a lot of senses, of the nature of awareness itself. Isn't it interesting that awareness itself does not cling? And awareness itself actually has a subtle kind of kindness toward the sense objects that it forms. So here we have, even more profoundly, a fundamental ground of being that has an innate peacefulness, non-clinging, non-suffering kindness, awareness itself. And then, perhaps, going even one step further, many people, including myself, have a sense that there's an underlying ultimate transcendental ground of being in which everything arises. Call it God, call it the great mystery, call it by whatever name, and that our deepest, most fundamental nature rests in that ground. And if that's true for you, and it's okay if it's not, but if you have any sense of that, that's another way as well to feel that our fundamental home is happiness. Unfortunately, so many things tend to drive us out of this home, this true nature of happiness. And two of the biggest are worries about the future and regrets about the past. So in this meditation, which will close out this program, we're going to, at least to some extent, let go of those things, worries about the future, regrets about the past, and rest ever more deeply in your true home, which is happiness. So, as always, find a comfortable place to sit where you can be relaxed and alert. Aware of your body your body breathing, your chest rising and falling with each breath. And now imagine standing in the street outside of your house with two heavy suitcases. And know that one of those suitcases is full of worries about the future. And the other suitcase, know that it is full of regrets about the past. Take a moment, standing there in the street, holding these heavy suitcases, and reflect about each one. Reflect about the future, how it will come when it comes, 
and that most of what we worry about will never happen. Standing out there in the street, reflect about the past, that other heavy suitcase. Consider how the past cannot be changed. All we can do in the present is to learn from it. Put in whatever corrections make sense. Become more skillful. Become a better person. And move on. Standing there in the street, feeling the weight of these suitcases and absorbing the wisdom of your own reflections right now, make a conscious decision. Do you want to drop the suitcase of worry about the future? And if so, simply drop it. Then, standing there in the street with the other suitcase so heavy about the past, make a conscious decision. Do you want to drop it? And if so, just drop it. And as soon as you have dropped the two suitcases, walk into your home and take your seat right where you are. And plop down, so relaxed, like someone coming home from a long trip, dropping suitcases and just relaxing. Rested in the present. Just breathing. Resting in the natural well-being of the parasympathetic nervous system. Resting in the fundamental well-being of awareness itself. Awareness which does not cling. Resting, if this is meaningful for you, in a sense of the infinite. The unconditional that's always present as each moment changes. Could be the universe itself, or maybe some underlying spiritual reality. allowing yourself to abide and rest 
ever more deeply as that. Sensing a peace, a joy, a well-being, shining through the cracks between each moment in time. A natural happiness. Always your true home.